Um, so, so this is really what we learned. Um, we learned about open, uh, open platforms. Arduino was, um, I don't know how many people here use Arduino, but it's, it, the, the, yeah, thank you, Arduino. It's really easy to use. It allows what's called physical computing, which means that you can, you can um, regular people can like use sensors and actuators, et cetera. It's, it used to be super hard, now it's super easy, and it's open so you can do derivative designs. Um, electronic manufacturing, super easy. Um, that, that's, a, that's a very small pick and place machine, but this basically robotic production is now something that anybody can afford. And then, and then the whole TJ uh, thing has been an absolute mind blower for us. Um, I just want to kind of walk a little bit through how we structure this. I'll be super fast, but, oh, I, and I just blew it. Um, okay, so this is called, the important thing in the open innovation model is getting what's called the, uh, the architecture of participation. It's like a great video game. Easy to pick up, hard to master. And this is kind of where we set it up. So the question is, how is it possible to do hard stuff with volunteers? And the answer is, is, that, is that you try to kind of incentivize them. Everybody who comes into our project does it for the same reason. It's not altruism, it's not generosity, it's to scratch their own itch. The great thing about an open platform is that if you want a feature that doesn't exist, it's easy to add it. And our, what our community encourages you to do is once you've added a feature, share it. And if it's good, we'll integrate it into the main code and let everybody have it. And so, and so this means that there's something for everybody to do. Sometimes it's just you know, answering questions, sometimes it's tech support, sometimes it's documentation, sometimes it's bug fixing, sometimes it's bug reporting, sometimes it's adding a line of code, sometimes it's documenting a line of code. And this is basically what happens is that this is the structure we're setting up now with the dev teams that you know, it starts with like, you know, when you do something, we acknowledge it, you give it credit, and they will send you a t-shirt. People love t-shirts. It's like they get a box that says, you did something valuable to the community, thank you. And then a little bit further, they, you know, when they do a little bit more work, they get hardware discounts, and then they get free hardware, and then they get like, flown into the dev meeting. At the end of the day, they get equity in the company, which I don't think has ever existed before, the idea of giving volunteers equity in the company. And this is sort of our experiment in turning the web's innovation model into a sustainable business that can do the stuff like compete with the Lockheed's and the Boeing's of the world. Um, I talked a little bit about, about open hardware, but this is sort of the business model. We give away the bits, we sell the atoms. We charge a very, a very simple price, which is whatever it costs, we charge 2.6 times that cost. 2.6 is like this magic number. It allows for two 40% margins. One 40% margin for the manufacturer, that's us, and another 40% margin for the retailer, the distributors. And this is, um, it's super transparent, and it's a lot less, that, so an aerospace margin would be like 1,000% or 10,000%. And by do doing 2.6%, it's basically within sort of striking distance of the cloners um, in China, and we have lots of them, but still, you know, so this is how we can sell this. This is like $140, and if you add the, and if you buy it with the GPS, the power module, et cetera, it's $180. And the cloners would be about $90, or about, actually the cloners are about $50 cheaper than us. And so what that $50 difference allows for is distributors, retailer, retailers, a really sustainable ecosystem of businesses around this, but it's so much cheaper than the than the, you know, the closed source professional ones that cost like thousands of dollars. So we think 2.6 is sort of the right model. And as our production costs go down, we just lower the prices accordingly. Um, the way we, uh, our, our designs are all licensed um, so that anybody can use them and they can even compete with us. They can commercially, they can use them commercially and sell against us. We don't love it. We wish that they would do a, do a little innovation, do what we call a derivative design, which is improve on the design. But if all they do is just copy it, okay, we can handle that. Um, we, the way, how do we compete? And the answer is we're just going to innovate faster. We have, we have one thing that cloners don't have, which is the community. The community is built around this, and the community is a really great, the community combined with just-in-time production, they're really get great at innovating. So we'll, we'll produce a new autopilot every six months for like zero dollars of R&D costs, whereas a traditional aerospace business would be about ten million dollars in six years for a new autopilot system. So that's what the web's innovation model gets us. Um, right now, we are not as good as the pros, um, but we're getting better faster. Um, so our biggest competitor, I think, is DJI, who we have huge respect for. A lot of people out there think the Chinese are, are, are just copying. They're not paying attention. The Chinese are doing fantastic engineering, fantastic production, incre increasingly good at design, marketing, documentation. We take them very seriously. 
And so we benchmark against DJI. And I would say we are not there yet. Um, but then the next version of code, which we'll release next week, we're going to be very close. And someday we hope to be able to be better than them for a fraction of the price. And, that's, and we think that, that's, that that model of, being, of opening an, uh, having an open alternative to the closed source uh, you know, products, where we try to be as good as them, but cheaper and more importantly, community-based, is fundamentally something the marketplace wants. Um, I, you know, I, 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 again, I take, our, I take our competitors, I take the commercial competitors very seriously. I think there's room for both, an open model and a closed model. And our job is to ensure that the open model is no less reliable, no lower performance, possibly even better performance than the closed one for people who want that. Um, Open source offers a, a lot of other advantages. Um, it's, again, free and fast R&D. It's actually exempt from a lot of regulatory barriers. So one thing, uh, one thing many of you may know is that autopilots are considered uh, export controlled. They're considered basically cruise missile controllers. And so how is it possible that we can ship them to say nothing of give them away? And the answer is there's an exemption in the, in the um, export control rules for public domain. Open source qualifies as public domain. Um, also, we don't create the code. All we do is we, the company, create the hardware, which is just commodity hardware. It's just your cell phone in a different shape. The code itself, which is the smart stuff, is created by the internet, for the internet, on the internet. You download it from, like, the web. It's created by volunteers. The regulations weren't set up to accommodate this. But the fact that it's free, the fact that it's public domain, means that it finds a kind of a safe place within the regulations to do this kind of stuff. Um, a couple other things. Um, as you know, we fly under the recreational, the non-commercial exemption to the FAA's rules, under 400 feet, within visual line of sight, away from filled up areas. Again, the biggest aerospace in the companies, companies in the world cannot fly without a COA, Certificate of Authorization, in the United States. My children can fly every weekend, fly real drones, because they're flying under this sort of open amateur level exemption. Um, and these other things are pretty, are pretty self-explanatory, but community-based development is absolutely crucial to what we do. And it's my job to simply structure the community so it continues to grow, so there's a place for everybody, so that people can not only consume, but also create and contribute. Um, there are definitely challenges um, in this model. As I say, the architecture of participation, getting that model right so it's easy for people to get started, um, but then ensuring that the quality at the end is as good as commercial ones ensuring that you have testing procedures and code review and documentation. Very, very hard to get it right, but you, we've seen it happen. Linux is open source, Firefox is open source, MySQL, Apache, all these things got the architecture of participation right in the software world. So we're confident that we will get there in the hardware world. We're getting very close, and, um, but, it's, but, it's, um, but it's, you know, it's a job that's never done. Um, there are open lit questions about, about, you know, about liability, about, you know, exactly where these things fit in the commercial domain. Again, we're giving away the software, so a lot of the usual kind of rules don't apply. How do you insure? You know, what kind of insurance do you need for this kind of stuff? You know, what kind of FCC clearance do you need? These are all kind of open questions that we're inv investigating. Um, also that, you know, we sell a box. This box does nothing. Then you download code from the internet, and then the box does something magical. Who's respond who's, who does the support? I mean, my company just sells the hardware. We only support the hardware and our tech support, and yet most problems come from the software side, which is created by volunteers online. How do we explain to consumers that the reason that this autopilot you know, isn't doing something quite right is that the codes got it wrong, and that you know, the volunteers made a mistake, and that the bug, they should be talking to the community, not us? People don't want to hear that. So fundamentally, we need to sort of structure the company so we can do support for the volunteer software. And so this is what the Red Hats and the IBMs do. They do support for Linux, and they build businesses around providing support for open source volunteer contr contributions. So we need to structure our company to do the same thing. Because at the end of the day, customers don't care whether it's open source, and they don't care, no, not, not, some customers do, but most of them just want it to work. And we need to be able to structure this so that we can offer professional quality performance and reliability for something that is essentially a volunteer contribution. Um, and the rest, so the rest of the stuff is, is sort of self-explanatory, but you know, building businesses around something where you don't protect the intellectual property is the challenge that we're all going through.